Thanks. You be seated. We uh, <coughs> are going to resume our study in Joseph in a few weeks. Um, right now, um, next week, we'll, uh, we'll be in Virginia with uh, my father-in-law's funeral. And uh, the guys are going to take care of the service for me. And then uh, the following week, I'll pick back up uh, on our, our series on the life of Joseph. Um, so I got this little bitty window that I wanted to take advantage of um, to just kind of be able to talk um, about us as a church. Uh, Wednesday night was our end of the year board meeting where we just kind of wrap things up. We looked back over the last couple of years. We looked over where we are right now. We looked over where we're heading. And, the, and I just wanted to share some of that with you as well. So this morning's going to be a little bit different, but to lay the groundwork, I want to go to an unusual passage. Um, it's in the book of Nehemiah, and it's in the story of the children of Israel and Nehemiah as they rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. Uh, if you know that story, uh, it's, it's probably one of the most uh, dramatic stories in the Old Testament. And if they're able to accomplish this incredible thing, what happens is um, uh, Nehemiah is actually the cupbearer for a pagan king. And in the process of doing that, he hears that the people in Jerusalem, uh, the walls still aren't rebuilt. Ezra has gone back and they've done the temple, but they haven't done the walls. So what ends up happening is Nehemiah gets burdened for that. And he goes back to Jerusalem to rebuild the wall. So the first seven chapters of Nehemiah talk about the, the building of the wall. And then uh, the next five chapters, the last five chapters, talk about the people. Um, one of the most difficult passages in the book of Nehemiah is chapter 3. Um, because chapter 3, as you're going to see this morning, is filled with names we can't pronounce, projects we don't understand, and people who are never, ever mentioned again in the Bible. And so when you, ever, when you do a study on the book of Nehemiah, most commentators just fly over chapter 3. They've got very little to say about chapter 3 because nobody kind of wants to dive into it. Um, but I think chapter 3 gives us some incredible insight. It's one of the reasons I think God put it in there. So this morning, I want to pull a couple of verses out there. I'm not going to get the names right. I'm not going to get the places right. I'm just going to try to get close, all right? And I want to pull some principles out. And then what I want to do is I want to tell you where we are right now as a church. And then I want to talk about some principles putting them together as we go forward as a church, as you go forward in your lives, as you go forward in your homes. Because the principles will apply across the board. So uh, here's the first one. Um, Nehemiah chapter 3. Next, it's talking about people who are building in the wall and where they're building. It says, next to them the Tekoites made repairs, but their nobles did not put the shoulders to the work of the Lord. Now it's interesting <clears throat> That in chapter 3, we have all these people mentioned and all of the things that they do. But in verse 5, he pulls out the leaders of the Tekoites and says, these guys didn't work. Now, <clears throat> for all of eternity, this is their claim to fame. Because it, here's the principle. God was watching. God knew who was working and who wasn't. And the group, the leaders from the Tekoites said, for whatever reason, we ain't doing that. So they unplugged from the project. And, and God says, look, I want you to know, I'm taking note of this. And for all of eternity, the leaders of the Tekoites are known as lazy bumps. Yet they wouldn't be part of the project. And they missed out. They missed out completely. Now what's interesting is that the reason this is mentioned in, chapter, in verse 5 is because of what's mentioned in verse 1. Listen to verse 1. Then Elijah, the high priest, rose up with his brethren and the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They consecrated it. They hung its doors. They built it as far as the Tower of the Hundred. They consecrated it, then as far as the Tower of Hanel. Notice what it says. Elijah, the high priest, this guy is the most spiritual person in all of the group. He's the religious leader. He's the guy who 
if you ever see pictures of the priest or if you've ever seen um, you know, those Indiana Jones movie with the high priest and the ephod and all of that kind of stuff, this is the guy. He didn't know how to do carpentry stuff. He didn't know how to do brick building stuff. But he said, I will get involved. So as a leader, as the leader, other than Nehemiah, he's like the top guy. He's the top religious guy. He's involved in the work itself. And then when you get to verse 5, he says, but the Tekoites, guess what? Their leaders wanted nothing to do with it. So one of the things that you see is that everyone, including the leadership, found something to do with the wall. Everybody jumped in. Everybody took a part of it. When you go through chapter 3, here's what you're going to see. <clears throat> you're going to find rulers involved in building the walls, gatekeepers, farmers, perfume makers, pharmacists, merchants, temple servants, goldsmith, um, people who work with gold. You're either going to find women mentioned. And you need to know that is highly significant because in this culture, that was not a, a project a woman was to do. But even the women got involved in the project. When you look at the whole list, here's what you find. You find people from Jerusalem, Jericho, Tekoa, Mizpah, all the outlying villages. In other words, everybody came in from everywhere to be a part of this thing, to make this project happen. One of the phrases you see over and over again in this phrase is, and next to them, and next to them, and next to them. It's this idea that they work together. They all jumped in this thing, and they all worked together, and they all helped each other as they went forward. The other thing that you see in this passage is um, this right here. Uh, Hanan and the inhabitants of Zenoa repaired the valley gate. So, and you see why everybody skips this chapter? They built it, they hung its doors, bolts and bars, repaired a thousand cubits of the wall as far as the refuge gate. Now here's what's significant. These guys get their job done, and then they keep going. In other words, it's like, okay, we got ours done. I don't know if they're, the area that they were building was flatter and so they didn't have to work as hard or wear out, but they got done fairly quickly. And rather than go back and just chill, they said, hey, look, let's go and let's keep building on. Let's go build more walls. Let's go as far as we can go. So they went and kept on working. So what you see is not only did they, they work, but you have people who did more work than other people because they could do more. So you lay out some of these principles for how this thing happened. Let me talk to you about where we are right now um, as a church. Um, uh, I had a guy early in my ministry who really drilled this into me, and so it's kind of become my um, foundation for figuring out uh, ministry. And he basically said this, there are three things that will hinder any ministry. People, money, and time. So <clears throat> for me, when I look at a ministry, particularly in our ministry specifically, I look at those three things. So like this past week when the board and I met, I looked at our ministry in those three areas, people, money, and time. Because those are the things that are going to hinder us or help us as we go forward. <clears throat> so I shared with the board where we are in those three areas. So let me share it with you. Um, people. Um, COVID, of course, has changed so much for so many, <clears throat> particularly uh, churches and, and, and all of that um, as, we, as we go. If you look at 2020, um, we averaged through 2020 about 51 families in every service. Um, <clears throat> we, as a church, look at, we have a family-focused ministry. So for us, when we, when we take attendance on, on Sunday with people coming in here, we did that because of COVID and, and alerting people and all that, and that's kind of gone by the wayside. But, I, but the, 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 um, the value of knowing what's happening numbers-wise has helped us tremendously. In 2020, we were averaging about 51 families. 
Um, in 2021, we averaged 66. Um, the directory is probably our best um, reflection of what happened. Uh, the last time we did our directory was 2019. We had 100 families in that directory. Um, we had 134 two years later. A typical year, we, we gain somewhere between three to five families. And when you mark out, you know, we don't lose a lot, but when we do, um, about three to five families was the average. It was closer to 15 last year. So people-wise, um, you know, we anticipating it, we have ordered more chairs that have been on order since back in the, in the spring. Um, because we anticipate um, that continuing to go. So people-wise, things here are um, doing very, very well. Um, Money-wise, um, 2020 was down a little bit over the, the previous couple of years just because uh, we had some building things going on in 2018, 2019. Um, this past year, um, the giving part of it has gone up um, every quarter, all year. So we're a lot better, better off financially than we were last year even. In addition to that, um, at least, rough estimate is at least 20% of everything that came in went to missions. Depending on what we include in that, that number can go as high as 24, 25%. Um, we're focused more on missions outside, not necessarily within um, us. So when you look at missions and special projects over last year, which you know my passion is uh, you either go to the mission field or you give to the mission field. Um, and we all pray for the mission field. So um, I've often said, you know, um, if the Lord would let me, I'd be on a mission field tomorrow. Um, so since I can't be there, um, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can for, for the people who are there. So we've been very fortunate as far as a church that financially we've been able to increase that quite a bit um, over the past year in particular. So financially, we're doing really, really well. When we come to time, that's, that's the issue right now. The one thing that COVID did was it forced people to take a look at how they spend their time. And in addition to that, with all of the, the protocols of quarantining and everything else, it, it pulls people in and out so often, it's just kind of a, a, an up-in-the-air kind of thing. So we've had a couple of things that have happened um, time-wise. And again, I'm, I, I just want you to let you know where we are. That's part of leadership is telling you exactly where we are. We've noticed that in... Um, Potlucks, for instance, um, we haven't had as much of the main course stuff brought in as we have in the past. Um, on funerals, um, we have had to go now to, on um, a couple of the funerals in particular in the past, um, we've had to go buy some salads and desserts. Uh, with the church cleanup, and again, I understand that, you know, this is getting bigger and it's more to clean and it's more to do. Uh, we made the decision a couple months ago to hire the church cleaning done now. So now we hired that done. So we can do the fill-in for um, here and there after a funeral or uh, those kinds of things. Um, as far as Sunday school goes, I would really love to see us get back to Sunday school every week. But you need to know, I will not take five people and burn them out on Sunday school. Um, I won't do it. We've, we, I've been that route. Many of you come from churches where you did that. You got involved in a ministry and they burned you out. And I, I understand that completely. But the reality of it is, if we want to do Sunday school, then we're going to have to have people step up to the plate to volunteer. Um, in a couple of months, we will be talking about small groups again. And doing a small group study like we had done in the past. Break it down into small into groups. But at that point, we're going to need people to volunteer to teach it. We're going to need people to volunteer to open their home. We're going to need people to volunteer to come. Um, and those are time commitments. 
Those are big time commitments. Um, so that's kind of where we are as far as, as, as the church right now. That, the, the thing that we have to work on as we go forward is the time aspect of it. And you know me, I, I will not, I'm not one of those people who believes that you do it because you've always done it. One of my pastor friends, you know, the best advice he has is this. If the horse is dead, dismount. You know, rather than keep riding. My kids love this statement so much. They got me a uh, horse, a little stuffed horse. And for, and for a lot of times, because I have a tendency to ride stuff for a while, even after it's dead. And when I'd start this, somebody would go, where's the horse? Where's the horse? And they'd throw it at me. Um, you know, it's like, Dad, let it go. We're over it. Okay, we move on. Um, and that's kind of the thing. I, I, you know, I'm not going to, just because we, a church is supposed to do all of these things, look, if, if people want it and we have the volunteers, we'll do it. If we don't, we won't. That's where we are. I, but I'm not going to burn out people who, you know as well as I do, if you're not careful, willing people get taken advantage of. And I don't want to be somebody who does that. Okay? And I don't want our church to be able to do that as well. So that's kind of where we are. So let me talk about it as we go into 2022. And again, I'm applying this to church, but this applies to your home as well. This applies to any organization you're volunteering for. And if you're part of, and we always encourage that, if you're part of a volunteer organization, we encourage you to jump in with both feet and be a part of it. Um, I think that's where Christians have the greatest influence, is in things outside the walls of this building. So here's the, here's the first principle, um, the first idea as you go forward. You've got to have a willing heart. That's important. You have to have a servant's heart. In your home, you want to change it dramatically? I, I tell couples this when, I, when they get married. Outserve each other. You want a great marriage? Try to outserve each other. Try to figure out who gets to clean the dishes first. Be fighting over that stuff. Who's taking out the trash? Outserve each other. One of the things that's interesting in, that, in Nehemiah chapter 3, listen to this. Malchiagja, whoever it is, the son of Rachel leader of the district of Beth Harserum, repaired the refuse gate. He built it and hung its doors with its bolts and bars. Notice what it says. This guy is a leader of his district. He's like the, 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 the mayor or the senator or the, the congressman of a, of a larger area. This area is about six to seven miles away from Jerusalem. You know what job he takes? The refuge gate. You know what that meant? In Jerusalem, there's a town dump. And everybody that wanted to go to the town dump had to go through the refuse gate. It was the gate to the town dump. This guy's job, this guy said, hey, I'll take the dump. I'll build the wall by the dump. So every day, people will walk by with their dirty, stinking, nasty trash and I'll get a good whiff of it all day long, the whole time we're building the walls. Somebody's got to do the, 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 the trash dump. He said, I'll do it. A willing heart. A heart that said, it's not important that of what you do. I've always said this. There are times that I'll come in here and something will need to be done. Um, a, a toilet will need to be clean or whatever else. And I've said this over and over again. The day that I cannot clean a toilet in this building is the day you need to fire me. Because no one is too good to do something when we're doing it for the Lord. And it takes a willing heart. More than anything else, that, that, that's a foundation. And in your home, you want to change the dynamic of your home? Outserve your spouse. Um, and you would be amazed how much this, this changes. You know, I, I, here, here's my challenge. Before you go to bed tonight, ask yourself this, those of you who are married, 
What did you do today to serve your spouse? That's that, that simple. You go, do you know how busy I am? A willing heart. What's more important than a relationship with your spouse? Well, you know, we have kids and everything else. Let me tell you something. The best thing you can do for your children is give them two parents who are madly in love and trying to outserve and outlove each other. And I cannot stress the long-term value of that. And I want to challenge you because one of the things as we go forward as a church, in your homes, in the organization, you've got to have that willing heart. You've got to have that heart that says, I'll do whatever I need to do. I may be uncomfortable with it. I may not be experienced with it. We'll talk about that in a second. But I'm willing to give it a shot. Look, the high priest, he starts out at verse 1. The high priest had no background building walls. But he said, I'll do it. I'll do it. Second idea that you see is this. Everyone does what they can. That you say, I, I understand. You know, we're, we're wrestling with this right now. As a board, we're really starting to wrestle with this because <clears throat> there were some things that when this ministry was, was founded, we had, um, we had set as, as ways to do things. One of the things was that after a guy has come here for a, a, a period of time, we put him on serving communion. And then we put him on as lay leader, and then we put him on as communion leader. Well, a couple of things have happened. No one COVID happened, so we went to these um, cellophane communion cup thingies. Um, and, and we've gone to that, so that's kind of taken out three people out of the four. Um, the other thing that's happened is standing up here and leading is intimidating now. Um, you, sitting out there, you don't realize how many people are out there. And then you talk about people who are shy or people who don't have that gift. And I understand we develop and we push ourselves out of our comfort zones and all that. I get all of that. But I also understand that this is a, this is a monumental ask. So we're wrestling with how do we nega- navigate all of that. Um, because I think it's important that your kids, your family, see you up here leading. But I also understand that um, if we were to give you $1,000 to do it, you still wouldn't do it. You know, if we were to start to pay people to come up here and do it, you wouldn't do it. I mean, it's just that big of a fear for you, and I, I get that. So we're wrestling with some of that kind of stuff as we go. Um, but that willing heart and that ability to go, okay, you know what, maybe I can't do that, but I can do this. I can find some place. You know what, my wall's done. I'm going to go keep going and building on. To the, I'm going to keep going down the line. Where you get involved and you go, you know what, I, I'm, I'm going to do what you can. Here, here's my challenge, and I, I, I shared this with you earlier. Life is short. It's fragile. If you were put on the sidelines right now, today, for three months, what impact's going to make? What ministry is going to be affected? What people are going to go, oh, you know what? We depend on them. See, if you can't think of, if you can't think of things that are impacted by you being pulled off to the sidelines for three months, I, I'm going to say this as nicely as I can, but your life's all about you. And if you want to find real joy and real contentment and real peace in life, what you find is, You find life by giving your life away. That's what Jesus teaches. If you want to find life, give it away. Take take your talents, gifts, and abilities. Go invest them in someone else, in someplace else. And if all of a sudden you look at it and go, well, you know, yeah, you know, my golfing partner would miss me. Come on, there's got to be more to it than that. Because the bottom line is, we think in terms of, Days, months, and years, God thinks of, time, of it in light of eternity. What impact is your being out of play for three months going to make in the kingdom work? And things that matter, and things that have eternal value. Um, 
you know, the thing that I, that, that I struggle with with these guys from Tekoa is this. They missed out. They missed out being part of one of the greatest Old Testament stories. And they're known with an asterisk to the greatest Old Testament story. These guys built the wall. Asterisk, except these guys who missed out. And I wonder sometimes what we are missing out on because we're not willing to say, I'm going to step outside my comfort zone. I'm going to have that willing heart. I'm going to go plug in wherever I can plug in. You know, one of the things that people often tell us here is, you know, when they get here and they go, you know, there's just a spirit here. There's just an attitude here. There's just an acceptance here that I don't see in a lot of other places. What you need to understand is the reason that's here is because we have spent a lot of time together. We have laughed. We have cried. We have built together. We have done so much stuff together. We've done it as a family. And we've watched out and taken care of each other. And that's just the way we want it to be. Because I think that's the way it should be. But what's so important is that sometimes we forget that we, some of us who've been here for a while, I mean, I'm going on 30 years this year. 30 years of watching God start this thing from a little bitty building you know, I'm trying to think of it. I mean, our, our, our little fellowship hall, I think our lobby is bigger than our other building. And I, but I look at it, and I look at all the blood, sweat, and tears that went through it, and all of the, 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 the losses that, of, of people that the Lord had called home, and all the stuff that we went through, and, and yet we all went through it together. And there's a bond here that people who stood on the sidelines never got to be a part of. And I, 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 don't, I don't want that for you because I have always believed this. And you need to know, as long as I stand up here on Sunday, I will always believe this. Because the second I don't believe this anymore, I'm out of here. I believe our best days are still in front of us. And when I look back at what God's done already, I don't know, what, I don't know how much better it can get, but I still believe our best days are in front of us. Because I see God doing more and more and more and more and more. And for those of us who've been here for the day, every time somebody new walks in here, we're like, yep, that's what we did it for. We've always said, we're doing this not for us, we're doing this for the people who've never walked through that door. So it's exciting to us to be able to be a part of it since, since the beginning part of it. And this is the last part of it is this. Remember, like the Tekoi, God's watching. He's watching. He's taking note. He's taking note of what you and I do while we have our time here on this earth. And I can't stress enough how important it is that we make it count. That we really sit back and go, you know what? I, my time here is short. I'm going to do what I can for the kingdom of God. I'm going to make a difference. My question is, what are you going to do? For 2022. I mean, what are you going to do? Where are you going to make a difference? Whose life are you going to focus on impacting and changing? Whose life are you going to pour your life into? I want to end with this story. Some of you know the story. <clears throat> but the guy's name was Edward Kimball. Now, that's not the Kimball from The Fugitive. That's a different Kimball, okay? Edward Kimball. Um, Edward Kendall was a Sunday school teacher in Chicago. And he had a boy in his class who was 18 years old. He was a shoe salesman. The boy's name was Dwight Moody, Dwight L. Moody. And Edward Kimball got really burdened for Dwight L. Moody. And he felt like he should talk to him about salvation. But in Edward Kimball's writing and, and talking about this story, he, he talks about how he almost didn't go. And I was struggling back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And one of the biographies about D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody, in his own words, talks about their encounter. Listen to what he says, okay? 
I recollect that my teacher came around behind the counter of the shop I was at work in. He put his hand on my shoulder and he talked to me about Christ and my soul. I had not felt that I even had a soul until then. I said to myself, this is a very strange thing. Here's a man who never saw me till lately. And he's weeping over my sins and I've never shed a tear for him. But I understand it now. And I know what it is to have a passion for men's souls and weep over their sins. Listen to this next part. I don't remember what he said. But I can feel the power of that man's hand on my shoulder tonight. It was not long after that I was brought into the kingdom of God. He didn't even remember what he said. But it was the person who had invested his life to go and talk to this 18-year-old kid at work about Christ. The story doesn't end there. Um, Dwight L. Moody turned out to be an evangelist preaching all over the world. When he was in the British Isles, there was a man by the name of Frederick Meyer who sat in one of his meetings and he became an evangelist. Meyer went around holding evangelistic meetings as well, and in one of his meetings, here's what he said. If you are not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you at least willing to be made willing? There was a guy sitting in the auditorium that night who couldn't let that go. His name was Wilbur Chapman. Wilbur Chapman couldn't let that go, and he eventually became an evangelist. Billy Sunday, who was a baseball player, ended up being influenced by the ministry of Wilbur Chapman. When Wilbur Chapman finally got out of evangelism, Billy Sunday took his place. Billy Sunday started, was having meetings all over the country, and he was in North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina. There's a group of Christian businessmen there who got so burdened underneath Billy Sunday's ministry that they said, we want to reach people for Christ. So they got together a small group, and they found one of the, the, one of the leading evangelists in the country at that time, a guy by the name of Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham, in Texas and Tennessee alone, had over 100,000 people come to Christ in his meetings. As Mordecai Ham was preaching there in North Carolina, there was a young man, 16-year-old young man in the service, and he struggled every single night. On the last night of that service, he went forward and put his faith and trust in Christ. You know him as Billy Graham. The rest of it's history that you're aware of. When we talk about Billy Graham, Mordecai Ham, some of these guys, Billy Sunday, Nobody talks a lot about Edward Kimball. But that's where it started. Because it was a Sunday school teacher. A Sunday school teacher. I talked this morning about the idea of God thinks in, times of, in terms of eternity, not in terms of years. What do you think it's like for Edward Kimball in heaven as he watches one visit multiplied to thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of lives. Is there a Billy Sunday in one of these kids that comes in here this morning? I don't know. There's probably a godly father, a godly mother that it's our responsibility to develop. Is there a future whatever in your neighbor that you're trying to reach? That person in your family? I don't know. I don't know. But I can tell you this. I can tell you this. You don't want to miss out. You don't want to miss out. You don't want to be the Tekoa that missed out with an asterisk by what God could have done with your life. I, honestly, I believe, personally, my theology says if Edward Kimball hadn't done that, somebody else would, but Edward Kimball would have missed out. 
But I think of the blessings that that guy has for all of eternity to be able to see a simple visit with a willing heart responding to God's prompting affected people for hundreds of years. I don't know what God has for this place. I can tell you right now there are missionaries who have with our help and our support and our prayers who are changing places in the world where there are people we've never met and will never meet till we get to heaven. And it's exciting to be a part of that. I don't know what the Lord has for you this year, but I do know this. That servant's heart, that willingness to let God use you, to step outside of your comfort zone, offers you things that you could not imagine when you step back and start to see how God used you. And for those of you who don't know my story, the fact that you have a Chicago boy preaching in a country church, living on an acreage with chickens, should tell you God can do anything. And as crazy as it is to me, I love it with all my heart. And I wouldn't want to be any place else. The only reason we're here is because all along our journey, we've been able to say, God, yeah, I'm not comfortable there, but I'll trust you. If that's where you want us, that's where we'll go. And watch God do some incredible things. So I end this morning with this. God saved us to so serve, not to sit and to soak. In order for the kingdom of God to go forward, we've got to be about work of serving him. It involves all of us serving where he has put us, with willing hearts and willing hands. Let him use you this next year. Let's pray. Lord, help us. Lord, I, I don't have a question that any of us want to be used. But so often, Lord, we let Satan get in our hearts and lives and, and, and create fear and doubt and things that keep us from just stepping forward and trusting you. So, Lord, I just pray that you would, in a unique way, use us. Lord, open our eyes to ministries and opportunities that are in front of us every day. Lord, as far as this ministry, continue to guide and direct and protect and use it, Lord, as only you can. And, Lord, when we, Lord willing, come to the end of this year, may we be able to look back at ways that you have used us to further your kingdom, to further the work that you would have us to do, and to share the gospel of Christ with our community. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Um, let's stand together. We're going to sing the first verse. There is a Redeemer. Let's stand as we sing.